everyone. This is Divya Maheshwari from MGM Allied Health Science Institute Indore. So my topic of discussion will be spinal tracts. They are very important in any neurological condition. So before moving towards our topic, let's first discuss something about the nervous system. So as we all know that our nervous system is being divided into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is divided into the brain and spinal cord. The brain being further divided into the prosencephalon, the mesencephalon and the rhombencephalon. The prosencephalon is the forebrain as we all know and it consists of the telencephalon and the diencephalon. The mesencephalon is the midbrain consisting of the crust cerebri, tectum and tegmentum and the rhombencephalon is the hindbrain which consists of pons, cerebellum and medulla. Now coming to the peripheral nervous system, it consists of the motor peripheral nervous system and the sensory peripheral nervous system. The motor peripheral nervous system consists of the voluntary and involuntary. The involuntary being all further called as autonomic motor response. The autonomic motor response is also divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now in, a, in any kind of stress condition, the sympathetic is being activated and in relaxation, parasympathetic dominates. The sensory peripheral nervous system is consisting of the special senses and general sensation. The general sensation being divided into the somatic and visceral. Example of any visceral uh, pain is like the abdominal cramps we have. Now, moving towards the central nervous system. The central nervous system consists of grey matter and white matter. The gray matter or the collection of neuronal bodies is further divided into the cortex and the nuclei. We all know cortex is the outermost layer and nuclei are the pieces of gray matter embedded in white matter, a very simple definition. Then the white matter, it comprises of exons. We all know they are further divided into ascending, descending tracts, associated fibers, commissional fibers. So this is about the gray matter and white matter. So now let's talk about a process, a very, very basic process. If my hand comes in contact of any cold or hot object, then the information will be taken up by the receptors, which are biological transducers. It will flow through nerves in form of action potential. Then it will be taken up to the spinal cord and from spinal cord, it will be taken up to the higher centers through ascending tracts. The higher center will be processing the information and will be guiding or ordering what action should be taken. The higher center send this information, sending tracts and about the two processes. Either it's modified the activity of organ or brings out the motor response to skeletal muscle. Now let's see a very uh, small diagram or a TS of a spinal cord. This is a TS of a spinal cord. It, it has a dorsal column, a ventral column and a lateral column. The dorsal column is purely consisting of ascending tracts. It carries those sensations which need immediate action. The ventral system and the lateral system consist of the mixed tracts. That means the ascending and descending both tracts are here. Now, we all know that from a spinal cord, there is a sensory root which emerges from the dorsal part and a motor root which emerges from the ventral part. At the trunk, they uh, intersect each other and crosses each other's way. Now, the dorsal part after this consists of sensory and motor both and uh, the ventrally, it consists of uh, mixed fibers. So now, let's move forward to our topic. First of all, we'll be discussing about the ascending pathway. So what is an ascending track or an ascending pathway? Since the exons which carry the information from the spinal cord to the brain, these together are termed as the ascending tracks. Now we'll be discussing about the dorsal column because it comprises of purely ascending tracks. 
the dorsal column having myelinating fibers uh, which are in a very high proportion they carry proprioceptive touch pressure and vibratory sensation so to define proprioception these are the sensation for the locomotion the dorsal column comprises of fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cunatus the fasciculus gracilis originate from the caudal end of the spinal cord it is comprising of the long ascending branches of primary afferents it enters cord through ipsilateral spinal root and terminate in the dorsal medulla in the nucleus gracilis now the fasciculus cunatus it origins from the mid thoracic la level lateral to the fasciculus gracilis it comprises of the primary afferent fibers of upper thoracic and cervical dorsal roots the termination is in the nucleus cunatus of the dorsal medulla now here is a figure showing these two tracts as you can see the fasciculus gracilis and cunatus the fibers are ascending upward to the medulla and they are terminating into the nucleus of the gracilis and the nucleus cunatus now from here they are synapsing on the neurons of dorsal column in the medulla the axons arising from this arch ventromedially as internal arcuate fiber here you can see in the figure and they decussate and form the medial lemniscae since the decussation is just a word used for intercrossing now they ascend to ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus and neurons from here project to the somatosensory cortex of parietal lobe so in this tract the lower limb is being controlled by the nucleus gracilis and the upper limb is being controlled by the nucleus cunatus now in tapes dorsalis there is involvement of posterior right column and posterior nerve root and this leads to loss of sense of position that is the romberg sign will be positive why because of lack of proprioceptive information so now let's move forward to our next ascending tract that is the spino cerebellar tract so before going into the details let's first see the functions of the cerebellum it is mainly responsible for the tone posture and muscle coordination especially ipsilaterally so whenever we are talking about any cerebellar tract or any cerebellar syndrome so basically these functions will be hindered so now coming to the tract it carries proprioceptive and cutaneous information to the cerebellum for coordination of movement simple now the spinal cerebellar tract is further divided into the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract and the ventral spinal cerebellar tract the origin of the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract is from the second or third lumbar segment axons originate ipsilaterally that means from same side they terminate ipsilaterally in dorsal and caudal parts of cerebellar vomics now coming to the ventral spinal cerebellar tract the origin is from the lamina of lumbar sacral cord this tract carries information from the lower limb lies ventral to the dorsal tract means anterior many axons decussate but some remain ipsilateral that means bahut sare axons jo ventral spinal cerebellar tract ke hain wo cross to karte hain lekin ipsilateral bhi kuch reh jate hain they ascend through medulla to reach upper pontine level the termination is contralaterally in anterior cerebellar vomix now there is a point that jitna zyada lateral tract hoga wo utna zyada fine movement ko control karta hai और जितना ज्यादा ट्रैक सेंट्रली सिचुएटेड होगा वो उतना ज्यादा मेजर मसल्स को कवर करेगा नाउ द डोर्सल स्पाइनो सेरेबल ट्रैक कंट्रोल्स फाइन कोऑर्डिनेशन ऑफ इंडिविजुअल लिम मसल्स लाइक अ पर्टिकुलर मूवमेंट इट्स बीइंग कंट्रोल बाय द डोर्सल स्पाइनो सेरेबल ट्रैक क्योंकि ये मोडालिटी स्पेसिफिक एंड स्पेस स्पेसिफिक होता है मोडालिटी स्पेसिफिक मीन्स इट इज मोड स्पेसिफिक किसी भी एक मोड में एंड वेंट्रल स्पाइनो सेरेबुलर ट्रैक्ट ट्रांसमिट्स इंफॉर्मेशन फॉर कोऑर्डिनेटेड मूवमेंट एंड पोस्चर ऑफ एंटायर लोअर लिम एंटायर लोअर लिम मतलब एक पूरा एक बल्क में एक मेजर मसल्स को वो कवर कर रहा है 
और डॉर्सल वाला फाइन मसल्स को कवर करता है सो नाउ लेट्स मूव टूवर्ड्स द स्पाइनोथेलमिक ट्रैक्ट्स द स्पाइनोथेलमिक ट्रैक्ट्स कैरी पेन टेम्परेचर क्रू टच एंड प्रेशर क्रू टच मीन्स द नॉन डिस्क्रिमिनेटिव टच इन विच अ पर्सन कैन नॉट टेल वॉट इज द ऑब्जेक्ट बींग टच टू हिम Now the spinothalamic tract is divided into the lateral spinothalamic tract and the ventral spinothalamic tract. So here in this diagram you can see the lateral spinothalamic tract. The cell bodies of the sensory neurons lies in the dorsal root ganglia. They enter the cord through the lateral division as you can see in this diagram. They release in the posterior horn by synapsing with the cells of substantia gelatinosa. From here, axons cross to the opposite side and ascend further to the uh, uh, to the ventral lateral nucleus of the thalamus, and they terminate over here. Since the fibers of lateral spinal thalamic tract are carrying pain and temperature, so the pain fibers, being lateral, become very superficial in the cervical region. so chordotomy can be performed safely to relieve pain in the opposite half now a condition known as the syringomyelia in which a fluid filled cavity is being formed in the spinal cord so in syringomyelia the involvement of decussetting fibers leads to the bilateral loss of pain and temperature below the level of lesion now let's further discuss about the ventral spinothalamic tract so this is a page showing the ventral spinothalamic tract now here you can see they carry crude touch and pressure they lead to loss of these on opposite side of body below the level of lesion so this is a diagram showing the ventral spinothalamic tract now let me summarize the ascending tract so this is a page showing the ascending tract a diagram in which the all the major ascending tracts has been compiled the posterior column being showing the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus the dorsal spinocerebellar tract is here the ventral spinocerebellar tract is here here is a spinothalamic tract the lateral and the ventral and here is a spino olivary tract so before moving towards the descending tract let's first discuss something about the cerebral hemisphere as we all are very well aware that the cerebral hemisphere is divided into the six lobes the frontal the parietal the occipital the temporal the insular and the limbic lobe now motor cortex or the cerebral cortex is involved in planning control and execution of voluntary movements here in this diagram you can clearly see that the area which is in front of the central gyrus is the primary motor area or the area number 4 it is the area with the lowest threshold for eliciting contralateral muscle contraction by electrical stimulation here is the presence of pyramidal cell bodies these neurons project their axons into cortico spinal tract now what is the function of this primary motor cortex so the primary motor cortex is responsible for the activation of specific muscles or group of muscles via motor neurons in the spinal cord now moving forward to the premotor cortex which is just in front of the primary motor cortex as you can see in the diagram This premotor cortex is divided into a dorsal and ventral area. Both contribute to the corticospinal tract, which is a descending tract. This premotor area acts as a lieutenant. Lieutenant means it decides which set of muscles will contract. So the dorsal premotor cortex is important in establishing a motor set or intention. contributing to the motor preparation in relation to internally guided movement whereas the ventral part is related to the execution of externally guided movement in relation to specific external stimulus now moving forward to the supplementary motor area which is situated at the supralateral part it contains a representation of body in which leg is posterior and face is anterior 
Its stimulation elicit the sensation of an urge to move or anticipation that a movement is about to occur. So this is about the motor cortex. Now moving towards the descending tracts. So what are the descending tracts? Basically in a very simple language descending tracts are the bundles of axons bringing information from higher center to either facilitate a motor response or to modify activity of any gland or organ. Now suppose for an example if I want to pick up a glass of water. So this decision will be accompanied by increased electrical activity in the cortex. Using information supplied by the visual cortex, motor cortex plans the ideal path for the hand to follow to reach the glass. The axons of neurons of primary motor cortex descends all the way into the spinal cord where they make final relay and then muscle execute the movement that enables me to pick up the glass. So, after discussing about the motor areas, we'll be dis discussing about our descending tract. The first one is the corticospinal tract. The corticospinal tract, the majority of fibers of this tract are arising from pyramidal cells in primary motor cortex, that is the area 4, and the premotor cortex, that is the area 6. Now, I'll be showing you a diagram. This is a diagram showing the lateral corticospinal tract and the ventral corticospinal tract. The fibers are passing through the corona radiata, internal capsule, ventral part of pons and the pyramids of medulla. Majority of fibers as you can see here in the diagram undergo motor decussation at the level of medulla. They descend in the lateral white column as the lateral corticospinal tracts and there are some fibers which remain uncrossed and they descend as anterior corticospinal tract. They terminate by synapsing with the interneurons which project to the motor neuron. Now, because of decussation, cerebral cortex or one side controls the muscles of the opposite half of the body. Now, the, if the lesion occurs above the level of decussation, it is known as upper motor neuron. And if the lesion occurs below the level of decussation, it is known as the lower motor Now, if the damage occurs at the level of the pyramids, it, the flaccid paralysis will occur of the contralateral limbs. If the damage occurs at the level of internal capsule, which occurs due to uh, mainly due to stroke, it will result into the contralateral hemiplegia. Now, paralysis initially will be flaccid but later becomes spastic, mostly marked in the distal uh, muscles of the extremities. Associated signs will be hyperactive deep tendon reflexes, increased tone and positive Babinski sign. We all know Babinski sign is normally present in human infants up to about 2 years. Its disappearance reflects completion of the myelination of corticospinal fibers and establishment of direct corticospinal connection to the lower motor neuron. Now, moving further to the other descending tracts. Now, moving forward to the other descending tracts, we are having the rubrospinal tract, the reticulospinal tract. There are other tracts also, but we are covering the major tracts. The rubrospinal tract facilitate activity of flexor muscles and inhibit activity of extensor antigravity muscles. The reticulospinal tract, it is being divided into the lateral reticulospinal tract and the medial one. The lateral exerts facilitatory influence on motor neurons supplying skeletal muscle. The medial exhibit inhibitory influence on motor neurons supplying skeletal muscles. So, here is a diagram which is showing the major descending tract. It is a little bit magnified diagram. Here, you can see the red one is the lateral corticospinal tract. The green one are the reticulospinal tract and the blue one is the vestibulospinal tract. The black is denoting the rubrospinal tract. You can see here the lamina is being supplied by them. And with this, we complete our topic of the spinal tracts. So, at last, I hope you all are very, very clear with the idea of the tract and what is their importance. 
and uh, why we all must be known with their functions and uh, what are their clinical correlations. If you guys are having any queries or the questions, you can freely ask in the comment box. Thank you.